Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us to, uh, at the Cancer Research Institute's new webinar series, Breakthroughs in Cancer Immunotherapy. Today's date is Thursday, June 13th, 2013. My name is Brian Brewer, and I am Director of Marketing and Communications for the Cancer Research Institute. Cancer Research Institute is a nonprofit organization established in 1953 to support scientific research aimed at harnessing our immune system's power to fight cancer. Scientists around the world, many of them funded by the Cancer Research Institute, have begun to develop powerful and effective cancer vaccines and antibody-based therapies that rally our immune defenses against cancer. Two of these treatments have received FDA approval within the past two years, and many more promising treatments are now in clinical trials around the world. In light of these exciting successes, we are now seeing with cancer immunotherapy. The Cancer Research Institute has declared June Cancer Immunotherapy Awareness Month. We present this webinar series, five in total, throughout the month of June, as a way to introduce you to some of the world's top scientists who are carrying out the important research that is saving lives. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll have an opportunity, opportunity to hear firsthand from an immunotherapy expert how this new treatment modality is overturning what we think of cancer. After a 15 to 20 minute presentation from our speaker, we will open the discussion to questions submitted by you. You can pose your questions at any time throughout the presentation by typing in the Q&A box you see on your screen in the lower right hand corner. I will do my best to get to everyone's questions. And before I introduce our speaker, I would first like to thank our sponsor, Dendrion Corporation, whose generous support has made this webinar series possible. Now it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Dr. Elizabeth Jaffe, currently serves as the co-director of the Division of Immunology and co-leader of the Gastrointestinal Cancers Program in the Department of Oncology at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, where she is also the Associate Director for Translational Research. She established and directs the Johns Hopkins Oncology Center Cell Processing and Gene Therapy CGMP facility. She's also a deputy director for the Institute for Translational and Clinical Research at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Jaffe holds six vaccine patents, has been the laboratory principal investigator on 11 clinical studies for which she has been elucidating the immunologic responses to vaccine therapies in patients with pancreatic and breast cancers. She is often quoted in news stories about cancer immunotherapy and is spearheading efforts to unlock the power of the immune system to fight pancreatic, breast, and other cancers. Dr. Jaffe, we are delighted that you could take time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you very much, Brian, for that wonderful um, introduction. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I am going to talk about mostly pancreatic cancer, but many of the principles that we're learning from pancreatic cancer we're applying to patients with breast cancer. I do want to disclose before I, I give you um, some of the information today that um, I do work closely with um, a biotech company called Aduro Biotech, and they have licensed from us several of our patents. Um, particularly the ones that uh, they have licensed that I will be talking about today are for GVAX and our newer vaccine platform, Listeria uh, Monocytogenes Vaccines. So uh, I'm going to talk about pancreatic cancer as an example, but the immune system can really be applied to many different cancers. And pancreatic cancer, I, I got interested in this disease because it really has been a cancer where we've made very little progress over the past 25 years. And I think the standard therapies just don't work for this disease. So it seemed like a very good um, type of cancer to begin to think of alternative therapies. And what's very important to understand about the immune system is that the immune system doesn't really necessarily um, going to work for one cancer and not another cancer. It's really more about understanding how the immune system and that particular cancer interacts. And so we've learned a lot over the past uh, 10 to 15 years about how the immune system sees and recognizes pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, melanomas, all different kinds of cancer. My group has worked very um, uh, vigilantly on looking at pancreatic cancer and somewhat at um, breast cancer as well. Um, so what are the technical advances that have allowed us to get to where we are today? 
Well, one of the major um, technical advances has been, of course, the development of a vaccine that has now recently been approved, Dendrion's um, dendritic cell vaccine. And dendritic cells I'll talk about a little bit because they are an important natural cell in the body that really serves as the director of the orchestra so of the immune system. So basically dendritic cells are able to identify proteins that are different in cancers relative to normal tissue and activate a whole cascade of responses in the immune system that cause the immune system to recognize cancer. And that's really the principle behind the first vaccine that was approved. Um, in addition, the other area that has made great progress has been in this concept of trying to understand what are the forces within a cancer that inhibits the immune system. And we call this tolerance um, or immune checkpoints. But as um, people who read the news see the progress going on, you are hearing about some of these agents that are actually able to inhibit these forces. So to change these forces so that the immune system can fu function effectively to fight cancer. The first drug approved in this category, category was ipilimumab, or it's known uh, commercially as Uravoy, and this is Bristol-Myers Squibb's drug. And this basically inhibits a signal on the immune cell that can recognize the cancer as different from the normal tissue and therefore kill that cancer. So that's important. So by inhibiting that signal, we now are able to give a drug that allows the immune system to function effectively. And it is really the first in its class to alter these kinds of signals, but now we're learning about many other signals within cancers, and these apply to all different cancers, not just the ones that they're initially shown to work in. In this case, this drug was shown to work in melanoma. I'm going to show you how this drug can also work in pancreatic cancer. So, but what's important is that other drugs are also being developed rapidly, and you've probably heard about PD-1, which is a new drug that's similar to CTLA-4 or ipilimumab. And again, it's a signal on these immune cells called T cells that normally can fight cancer. In this case, these cells, um, the, these um, signals inhibit the immune system from fighting cancer. So these drugs inhibit those signals, and now those cells can fight cancer. So, um, as I mentioned, there are these new drugs that are being developed, and I've mentioned two. There are many others that are being developed, and they're being shown not to work just in diseases that in the past, or cancers in the past, that were thought to be more susceptible to the immune system, like melanoma. But they're working in lung cancer, they're working in pancreatic cancer, they're working in, in breast cancers. Um, and what's important to understand is that these targets, these targets on the immune system that are keeping the immune system from fighting a cancer are not um, tumor specific, type specific. And so that's why we could start to apply these principles to cancers like pancreatic cancer, like breast cancer. So this is very important. And how, to, how are we making this progress? Well, we're making these, this progress in two ways. Some of it is through animal models, and the best models for the immune system are uh, mouse models, and many of our studies take place initially in mouse models, and then we move them to patients. And then the other way we're learning about this is in patients, of course. And what's important is we're also identifying something called biomarkers that allow us to determine who is going to respond to the particular immune-based therapy. And so all of this, these advances are happening now. They're making their ways to the clinics very rapidly, and they're also getting approved pretty rapidly. Um, and becoming standard of care. So this is complex, and I don't mean for it to be complex. What I mean for it to do is to really show you how much we've learned in even the past 10 years. So now that we have the ability to sequence a cancer, so to understand all the genes involved in causing this cancer, we've learned a couple of important principles. And these principles help us develop new therapies. The first principle we've learned is that um, we know that there is basically a um, gradual progression of gene changes that occur in a particular cancer. And so many cancers, many different people's cancers, if it's the same type of cancer, such as pancreatic cancer, will express the same set of genes in the same order that they occur. So in pancreatic cancer, the first thing we really see that's important that happens in the earliest pre-malignant lesion is something called a mutation in KRAS. That is a very important gene for which we are now developing ways to target KRAS, to alter this mutation, so that eventually we hope we can slow the progression of this cancer by targeting specific genes. 
And one of the ways that we're learning to target this gene, and I will show you this a little later, is through um, developing a vaccine that can direct the immune system toward this gene. What's also important to understand is that we realize it's not just the genetic changes that occur that cause cancer, but along with these genetic changes are changes in the immune response. And we always think of the immune response as being a good thing, but the immune response can also be a bad thing in the sense that depending on the type of immune cells that are brought in, they could actually help the cancer grow. And this was something we really needed to better understand before we can make the best kinds of immunotherapy. And so what we now know is that there are certain types of immune cells that are called regulatory cells, and they comprise macrophages and regulatory T cells and neutrophils. Um, these cells come in early at the earliest um, genetic change in a cancer, and they progress along with the increasing number of genetic changes that occur in cancer. And this is true, again, for many cancers. I'm showing you what's been shown for pancreatic cancer. And it's within these immune cells that these signals, such as CTLA-4 or PD-1, are expressed that inhibit a good immune response against the cancer. So these are basic principles that we've learned over the past 10 years that are now allowing us to make great progress in the clinics. And so just looking at a pancreatic cancer, this is a patient's pancreatic cancer. This is a patient who went to surgery, had their cancer removed, and then we looked at it under the microscope. And these are what the cancer cells look like. They're these big cells with big nuclei over here, too. But then they also have this reactive tissue. We call this um, a re reactive stroma. But what's most important is that's where the regulatory immune cells come in. In this case, these are regulatory T cells, these black dots here. These are all immune cells coming in, reacting to the tumor. The problem is the tumor is attracting the wrong immune cells. These are the cells that are going to inhibit the immune cells we want to get into the cancer to actually recognize the cancer and kill it. And that's what we had to understand before we could develop new therapies. And so we now know, and this is pretty complex, and I'm, I'm not trying to confuse people, but I just want to point out that the tumor cell expresses many different factors that attract these regulatory cells that are T cells, dendritic cells, all sorts of cells that help the cancer grow. And when that cell comes in that has the ability, and we call it an effector T cell, to recognize and kill cancer, and that would be this cell here, Unfortunately, it gets greeted by these signals that inhibit the cell from actually killing the cancer. But we now have drugs that can inhibit these signals, and I mentioned to you the one that's approved is CTLA-4, and then we also have a drug to PD-1, PD as well as some other drugs that can now inhibit these signals and allow us to fight the cancer. I'm just going to move through this quickly. Sorry about this. So, and again, one more point on this is that the immune system can either help the cancer or, or it can fight against the cancer. And it's that dendritic cell that provides signals to the T cell, that's the killer cell, that can either help the T cell fight the cancer or it can inhibit the T cell. And it's drugs that, that are targeted against the inhibitors that we're really looking at that, we can, that can allow us to fight the cancer, allow that T cell to activate and become a positive force against the cancer. So the bottom line is that the tumor's environment, where the tumor's developing, is changing all the time. And there's this opposition between these signals that are helping the cancer or supporting it and fighting the cancer. And we're learning a lot. And this is all of the ones that we're learning help the cancer that we're developing drugs against. And these are all the ones that we're finding help the, the, t the immune system fight the cancer, and we're developing agents to help these do better jobs. So it's now possible to take advantage about what we know about ca cancer-causing inflammation or the immune response that's helpful to the cancer to develop immunotherapies that can reverse the purpose of this negative inflammation in favor of the anti-cancer response. And we have been developing a dendritic cell-like vaccine. So this is a natural way of activating the dendritic cells in the body. And it's basically um, two cell lines. In this case, it's pancreatic cancer cells. But we've also developed a breast cancer vaccine as well that's being tested in patients. And these cells have been genetically modified to express an immune-alerting protein called GMCSF. So this is the vaccine cell. 
It produces its immune alerting um, protein. It brings in that dendritic cell that is the director of the orchestra. This now goes to the lymph nodes. Everyone knows what lymph nodes are. The lymph nodes are very important because that's where the immune cells are, where they get activated. And then these cells can then go to the cancer and hopefully fight the cancer. But we do have to give drugs. And one drug that we give is something called cyclophosphamide. That's um, actually, when we give it at low doses, it can modulate or it can inhibit the regulatory T cells and allow these um, killer T cells to recognize and kill the cancer. Um, it's also important to know what it is that the cancer expresses, what proteins that are different from um, the normal tissue. And we've been able to use um, the immune cells from patients who respond to our vaccine. And the vaccine is given as an injection under the skin like any other vaccine. So it's a very simple injection. Patients tolerate it well. They get it in the clinic. It takes a few minutes, and then they go home. And sometimes they get skin reactions, which is a good thing. But usually um, they feel fine otherwise, and um, they come back about once a month for this treatment. Well, we've been able to use their immune cells that we believe are fighting the cancer. We take a little bit of their blood, and we've been able to pick out the proteins in the cancer that the immune system is reacting to. And one of the ones that we identified is mesothelin. And this has now become a biomarker of response for um, pancreatic cancer immunotherapy that's helped us to figure out how the vaccine is doing in the clinics. And we found that mesothelin is expressed by 100% of pancreatic cancers. And the more mesothelin in the tumor, just naturally, the more mesothelin in the tumor, the less survival benefit the patient has. So the patient is going to be much more likely to die faster if they have a lot of mesothelin expressed. And so it seems like an important protein to target in the patient. And so we did complete a clinical trial, of several clinical trials. The most recent was a larger clinical trial looking at our vaccine, which are these two tumor cells genetically modified to express the dendritic cell alerting protein. And what we found was that patients who went on to long-term survival, and we have patients as long as 15 years out now with pancreatic cancer who are surviving, what we found was that um, they developed an immune response against mesothelin, and they maintain that immune response. And again, not trying to confuse anyone, this is just an example of the patients who are disease-free greater than three years, some of them now add as much as um, to, uh, 12 to 15 years. And they all develop these very high responses against the protein. This is zero response. This is 100% response. But it takes many vaccines. So it took at least four vaccines to get this to this point. So again, with these treatments, we need to treat them. We need to treat patients continuously. Patients doing well on this therapy now come in every six months for a boost. And then we measure these responses. And if they still have these responses, we continue to boost as long as they haven't had the cancer come back. And this um, just shows that it's not just the number of these cells, but also the potency. This is just a measure of potency. And so we actually can measure how potent the T cells are in the blood. So now we have a team of surgeons and pathologists and uh, medical oncologists who are doing many of these studies. The newest study we're doing is a very important study because it allows us to really see how the vaccine is working um, in the pancreas cancer. And the reason we can do this is patients undergo treatment two weeks before they undergo surgical resection of their cancer. And then they go on to many more vaccinations um, until their cancer occurs. And this is very important because for the first time, we're able to see two weeks after we give a vaccine, what does it look like in the pancreas? What has it done to the pancreatic tumor? And I had shown you before that usually you just see lots of cancer cells with a stromal reaction. Well, here what you're seeing are lymph nodes coming into the cancer. So this vaccine is powerful enough that it's causing these lymph, these are all lymphocytes that are activated against the cancer that are infiltrating this patient's cancer. Okay, and they even, this is a, um, looking at the whole resected tumor and they're even around the tumor. Okay, they're inside the tumor, but they're also coming around the tumor. So in two weeks' time, we were able, in a good number of these patients who have been treated before surgery, get the immune system revved up and entering the cancer. And they even stain. Again, this is not meant to be complex, but we can stain to show that they look like lymph nodes. This is, these are all cells, immune cells they're staining for coming in, T cells, B cells, and those dendritic cells all coming in 
to these lymphoid um, aggregates or lymph nodes in the cancer. And we can dissect those lymph nodes, and we could start to look at the genes that are expressed by the immune cells. Okay, so this is just taking under the microscope, dissecting it out, it's no longer there, and then we can use our new gene um, sequencing approaches to be able to figure out what those genes are. This is a very powerful approach, and again, not to confuse anyone, but to show you that um, these are different types of immune cells. The Th2 and the regulatory T cell downregulate um, the killer T cells, so they're bad cells to have there. The Th1 and Th2 are good cells to have there. These are a list of the genes we are studying, and basically what to get out of this is that red is good and green or yellow is bad. And you can see that the good cells, there's lots of good cells and very few um, bad cells. Okay, the bad cells are in yellow and those are downregulated. So that's exactly what we want to see, and that's what we would hope um, would mean that patients are doing well. So just to show you an example of um, what a patient who showed this nice response early on, what happened three years later, this is a person who completed the whole therapy, and he had these lymph nodes in his cancer, and he was coming back every six months for a boost. Second. And he um, received his first boost without problems, but on the second boost, which was about two and a half years later, um, he felt great. Um, he had not felt good when he had the cancer. The cancer was removed. He got the therapy. He's now feeling great, back at work, having a normal life. He's a runner. Um, he had no laboratory abnormalities, but his CAT scan, so we had to take a, a look at his, at his pancreas just to make sure he hadn't recurred. And unfortunately, we did see something that looked like it could be a recurrence. And this is what it looked like. Here's the residual part of his pancreas, and it actually looks like um, there may be a tumor there. But he felt great, unlike the first time he presented. And he actually assured us that he did not have the cancer coming back. But we had to take him to surgery because we could have taken the cancer out again. And so we took him to surgery. And sure enough, he was right. The patient's always right. I've learned that a long time ago. You can see, when we looked at the mass that was in his, in his um, pancreas, what it was, was a chronic inflammation. It looked like the immune system was alerted. Maybe the cancer was trying to come back, and the immune system was alerted. No tumor, only immune cells. So this is the first time we've ever seen this in a pancreatic cancer patient. There are always a recurrence when you go in there, and that's why the surgeons wanted to go in and look. We've now had some other patients who are similar, and now we can start to watch them on CAT scan, and if nothing changes um, and they're feeling good, we're not necessarily going to take them to uh, surgery. So that, these are patients who undergo surgery who we can keep under control. Now, what about all those patients who present with metastatic cancer? That's a big problem, and those are the patients who have, um, on average, three to six months to live. We now have some chemotherapies that have a median survival of about six to eight months, and that's good. That's much better, but they are very toxic. Patients end up being um, hospitalized a fair bit for the complications. And let's face it, who wants to spend all that time getting chemotherapy feeling sick when you only have, on average, six to eight months before your disease progresses? Once it starts progressing, typically with pancreatic cancer, um, you can die pretty quickly, unfortunately, once it starts to advance. Well, this is a study done by some colleagues of ours in, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, Dr. Beatty and Dr. Vondaheit, and they, present, they reported this. It was a very small study, but they had reported looking at one of those immune modulating agents, this one to another protein on um, the T cell that inhibits it from, that, that um, allows it to function better if you stimulate it. So this is a stimulating protein called CD40. So it stimulates a signal on the T cell to make it work better. And what they showed is when you give that antibody with chemotherapy, they can take a person who has all this tumor. This is liver tumors here in yellow um, arrows. You can give this antibody, and after three cycles, it looks like they significantly um, shrink. You can see that here, but you can particularly see it here. And they saw this happen in quite a few patients receiving this antibody, and this lasted for at least the six to eight month period that you would expect, but with very few side effects. So we're building, um, the field is building on these results, and we're building on the vaccine results because the vaccine activates the killer T cell, but we also want to make the killer T cell the best kind of T cell it is. So we wanted to combine a vaccine 
that induces a killer T cell with agents that can make the T cell function better. So this is Young Lee, who's a young um, clin clinician and expert in pancreatic cancer at our institution, and she did this study. And this um, was recently presented and is being published uh, currently. It should be out in press soon, where she compared patients who got ipilimumab, which is Uruvoy, the anti-CTLA-4 antibody alone, which is approved for melanoma, versus giving it with our vaccine to patients with pancreatic cancer who um, failed chemotherapy with metastasis, who had only about two to three months to live. And so they just got every three weeks, they got treatment for four weeks, and then they went on to a maintenance every six weeks. And again, this is outpatient therapy, and they don't get the side effects they get with um, chemotherapy. And what we saw, now these are patients who had two to three months to live. What we saw is if we give the drug that activates the T cell alone, we really don't see a great response. You have to give it with the vaccine that induces a T cell. When you do that, you get a much better response and you double the sur overall survival uh, benefit. But what's important is that this continues on. So patients who get a benefit can go on sometimes for two years with this benefit. And we could tell who those patients are because they develop a T cell response to mesothelin. And just to show you how powerful this is, this is another person's CAT scan. This is looking at their lungs. This is their heart. And these are tumors here. This is another part. This is all before treatment. Here's another cancer. What's interesting about these agents is that when you give the treatment, they sometimes start to grow first over the first two months of treatment. So you can see this is the same lesion. Same lesion, same lesion, okay. However, now by the time you get to three months into the treatment, you see the tumors are starting to um, necrose. They're going away. They're almost gone. So when we get a response, we get a really good response. And even patients who have failed chemotherapy and are very close to death are responding and having good quality of life. And this is just looking at their biomarkers and how when we give the treatment, as the biomarkers going up, they come back down. We give the treatment, give the treatment here as the biomarker comes up, comes back down. So that's more evidence that the, the response is immediate to um, the treatment. So I'm just going to leave you with um, one more point that, you know, we are making progress. It's going to take probably five to ten more years to get the best agents into the clinics and to figure out the best ways to combine those agents, but we're making a lot of progress. These agents are independent of the cancer type, so this should work for pancreas, breast, melanoma, um, colon cancer. They're being tried in many different cancers now. But really, the place to be long term is to really try to use these agents in early disease, when it's still at the level of the pre-malignancy. It's really a time to do that because as we start to understand the genetics of each cancer, you can start to target the earliest genetic change. And by doing that, you can hopefully prevent progression of more genetic changes, to, um, to what, which is what needs to occur for the cancer to develop. And so as an example, we, we currently have vaccines approved for human papillomavirus-associated cancer, cervical cancer. And what's important is that we give this to young people, to teenagers. Well, why do we give it to teenagers? It's because it's before they've been exposed to the virus. That's when the immune system is going to be at its best, at the earliest time point before um, exposure to the virus. And so how are we able to start to think about this for cancers like pancreas cancer, breast cancer? Well, by understanding the earliest genetic and also inflammatory changes that are, that are driving the cancer development, we can use agents to inhibit those changes and hopefully prevent um, these cancers in the future. So what I'm talking about is that diagram, again, where if we can target with a vaccine the earliest gene that's changed, along with alter this inflammation so that it's no longer inhibiting the immune response, but actually helping the immune response see the um, genetic change, then maybe we can give this to people in their 20s and prevent cancer from developing. And so as I mentioned, we are developing a new vaccine. You don't want to give two whole cancer cells lines to patients who don't have cancer. We need vaccines that can also alert the dendritic cell or the director of the orchestra or the director of the immune response 
um, in a way that they see the, new, the early protein changes in a cancer. And so in this case, we're using a bacteria called Listeria monocytogenes. It's a common bacteria. doesn't cause a lot of problems to patients. We've modified it so that it can't um, be transmitted between patients. And we've put in the gene for mutated KRAS, the earliest genetic change. Now, we've tested this vaccine in patients with pancreatic cancer, and we're actually seeing some great responses in patients with pancreatic cancer. And we just reported this at the big um, cancer meeting, ASCA, where patients who get the Listeria vaccine, you can see this is amazing. These are patients who failed chemotherapy, metastatic disease. They also are doing very well with just this vaccine living um, out over a year or longer um, with regressions of their tumors. So again, another powerful vaccine. It's very safe in patients. We can move in. This is just showing how the change in their biomarkers are pretty significant. So a good number of the patients have um, had a decline in their tumor burden with a decline in their biomarkers. Um, so this vaccine is just a, a very um, simple vector, easy to make. It induces immune responses. We've been testing it preclinically for prevention in mice. It can induce good immune responses in the mouse. And basically, we are treating mice um, as early as the first genetic alteration with mutated KRAS because these mice are genetically programmed to develop pancreatic cancer. And they um, undergo genetic alteration with mutated KRAS followed by um, mutated P53, two of the most important genes driving pancreatic cancer in humans. And they develop cancers that look just like human cancer. And just to show you, when we give it early at the time that the mouse is a teenager, we can actually prevent in up to 40% of the mice long term by targeting KRAS alone and altering just one of the cell populations that are helping to cause cancer. We can prevent progression of that to cancer. So, and this is long term, um, and it works quite well. Hello? Hello? Hi, Dr. Jaffe. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. We got, I got turned off for a second there. Anyway, I was just going to finish up and just say that, um, but if you start when they're more, um, later on when they're adults, we no longer can prevent um, cancer from happening. So it looks like we have the ability to go early, and we're developing this so that hopefully in the next two to three years we could start treating um, uh, people who are at high risk for developing um, pancreatic cancer and possibly breast cancers with um, an approach such as this. And again, I'll, I'll stop there um, and just point out that there are um, a lot of new things underway. I mentioned vaccines. I mentioned the fact that um, we are working on these agents that alter the negative inflammatory response, so you get a good anti-cancer immune response. But um, also coming down the line are things where we can s actually sequence a patient's tumor individually and develop a vaccine such as the Listeria vaccine that targets specific mutations in a patient. And we're calling that individual patient mutation vaccines. And again, I think you may be seeing these in the clinics as early as um, a year or two from now. And then already in the clinics are engineering these killer T cells um, called, and they call them CARs. This is work being done by a number of investigators um, around the country where they actually take T cells from patients, these killer T cells, activate them, genetically engineer them to see specific antigens like mesothelin and uh, give them back. And they're, they're causing a lot of tumor regressions in patients who've had otherwise no hope for a response to cancer. So again, these are early studies, but they're already in the clinics. And um, I think um, over the next five to 10 years, some of these will uh, be approved and, and be a part of our treatments um, standard of care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe, for that very interesting presentation. It sounds like there is a lot of hope for patients with pancreatic cancer and other types of cancers. Of course, understanding that some of these things are still a couple of years away, um, which of course is a very difficult thing for people to hear who are facing these diseases now. Um, someone had asked, how does someone enroll in a clinical trial? Where do they get access to these? 
course, right. So, um, you know, you need to. Um, you can go to the individual institutions. I'm sorry. What? Can you hear me? Uh, no. <laughs> well, while, while they um, sort of okay. on their type, uh, the, the sound problems, I do know that uh, at the Cancer Research Institute, on our website, we have a page that's devoted to cancer and you know, therapy clinical trials, and you can navigate there by going to cancerresearch.org forward slash clinical dash trial. And... Uh, Dr. Jaffe, is your microphone on yet? Can you hear? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We are good. Right. So, so there are a number of different websites. Um, the Cancer Research Institute, um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov is another place where you can find these. And then, um, there, depending on the cancer, there are different foundations. So for pancreatic cancer, there's um, PanCan and the West Garden, and they all keep running lists as well. And each, each cancer has these as well. So, um, and some of these programs, some of these um, foundations have um, people who can actually help you navigate based on the stage of your disease. So I, I recommend you make use of these resources. For some reason, I'm still having trouble. I'm sorry, you keep coming in and out, Brian. Okay, uh, we were asking where are some of the best places, in the, at least in the United States, where, where cutting-edge treatment is happening for patients with pancreatic cancer? Yes, please. Right, there are a number of institutions besides ourselves. Um, we probably see the most in the U.S., um, MD Anderson certainly sees many patients. They don't have as much of an immunotherapy program. Um, uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, also um, sees many of these patients, also um, uh, one of the uh, unique centers. And then University of Pennsylvania is increasing um, their number of clinical trials as well. Um, and then uh, Sloan Kettering does have some of these studies for pancreatic cancer. They certainly have for many other cancers, and they're increasing with uh, pancreatic cancer as well. Uh, one, of the, one of the side effects of ipilimumab is um, can be severe autoimmunity because you're rubbing up the immune system. And in that particular case, the, the therapy is not specific to cancer. It's specific to the immune system. Um, although, of course, doctors have learned how to manage those symptoms of autoimmunity once they begin to emerge, it, are patients still, uh, should they be concerned about these, uh, th these types of immunotherapies or potential? Right. I, I think that's a very important question. I think um, what, what you have to understand about it is it's almost a good thing in a sense that we've reached the point where we have agents that can take the immune system to such an activation state that it causes autoimmunity. For the majority of patients, we know the signs. We're getting very familiar with these drugs, especially if you get them at an institution with experience with these drugs, that we can pick up at the earliest signs and we can intervene. And most of those patients do quite well and even are willing to go back on the drug because they're doing well with their cancer and they're doing well, and they otherwise feel great. So, um, so yes, we always have to be concerned with any drug, but if, if administered by the right people, it can be monitored very well. Now, also, one of the reasons I like to talk about the balance between the anti-cancer and the pro-cancer immune response is that what we still need to understand is not only how to activate the T cell against the cancer, but how to turn it off when we no longer need it so that we can avoid the autoimmunity. And, and that's going to come. First, we need to see the autoimmunity. Now we need to use, um, you know, we need to gear res research at trying to better fine tune those responses. And I think over the next five to 10 years, you'll see that these drugs. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jaffe, um, there's also been some discussion about um, the immune system actually causing cancer in some cases where you have chronic inflammation. Has there been any uh, research into possible immune-related causes? Um, excellent, excellent point. And so 
absolutely true. So pancreatitis, if, if it becomes a chronic condition, is actually one of the um, uh, risk factors for pancreatic cancer. And we are all now trying to understand this. And there is a fair bit of research ongoing, at least as it relates to pancreatic cancer and, and, and you know, its, its negative inflammatory responses. So, um, so yes, so that is happening. And that's all part of trying to reverse this bad inflammation early. And we believe a lot of those signals are the same as what we're learning about as you go from the premalignant, from the normal tissue to the premalignant lesion. Those are all similar to a chronic. Uh, this is a question that we received on another earlier in the series. Uh, what immunotherapy options are available to patients that have compromised immune? That, that, that is so much harder. That is, that is a really good question. Um, the best thing that can happen is to first fix that problem to be treated for the HIV. It's, it's very hard. Um, to really expect these agents when the, the T cells, the killer cells, aren't there to work. Now, the types of immunotherapy that could still work are ones that are antibodies that target a protein on the cancer. That still can work because they require something called innate immune cells, and those innate immune cells are usually not the ones that are affected. We have a question about, are there any age restrictions for going into a clinical trial of, a, of an immunotherapy? Right, so currently we don't. Um, we, it's more based on um, how bad the cancer is, how the patient's doing compared to the cancer, um, and um, to make sure that their immune system is competent enough to be able to respond. And to be honest with you, we have treated patients at all ages, including early 80s, not seen responses based on age alone as a criteria. So age does not seem to interfere. Um, it's these other criteria, and you know, usually age is not the limiting factor. Okay. Uh, you mentioned cyclophosphamide as uh, one of the treatments that are used uh, right now, and that is a chemotherapy. And so the question is, how does immunotherapy integrate with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, what, what, what is, what's, what's the next five to 10 years, what's the next 20 years going to look like in terms of where, what immunotherapy's role is in cancer treatment? That, that's also a wonderful question. Um, so there's a lot of research ongoing. In fact, we currently integrate our um, immunotherapy with surgically resected um, patients. That's some of the work we do where patients undergo immunotherapy, then surgery, then immunotherapy. And um, we find that patients seem to do better when you integrate the two. Radiation is also very important. We're learning that radiation not only um, uh, shrinks the cancer, makes the immune system more functional, but more importantly, it alters the cancer, allowing the immune system to have better access. And one of the things it's doing is it's altering those proteins that are inhibiting the immune system. So it's another way of getting um, a pro-anti-cancer immune response as opposed to a pro-cancer immune response. So we are, we are doing many studies now, and we're, in fact, um, in pancreatic cancer, the CRI and our group and several other groups are working on a protocol to see how radiation can help make the immunotherapy um, even better. But at long term, I think the, the answer to the long term view is I look at surgery as being important to understanding what, what the signals are that are inhibiting the immune response so that we know which immune agents to give and also knowing what the genes are so we know what genes to target. So I see surgery as being a very limited but important part of the whole treatment plan and radiation as well being a limited but altering at the right time the immune um, environment of the cancer to allow the immune system in. Um, well, Dr. Jaffe, thank you so much for being with us. We started a couple minutes late, so now we're at the 45-minute mark. So uh, first, let me say thank you. Uh, I'm sure everyone here in the webinar is very appreciative of you taking your time out today to speak with us about these very promising new treatments for pancreatic and other types of cancer, including breast cancer. Uh, before we go,
I'd like to let everyone know that next Tuesday, June 18th, we have another webinar, the fourth in the series, Treating Melanoma with Immunotherapy with Dr. Jed Walchuk. Dr. Walchuk's been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNN.com, uh, recently, uh, earlier this month, because of a, of a new therapy, a combination approach that brings two immunotherapies together and has seen very dramatic responses in melanoma patients. And as Dr. Jaffe pointed out, Everything we learn about immunotherapy in one type of cancer can ultimately be applied to other types of cancer too. So that means it's good news for a lot of patient populations. There's a lot of excitement right now. So please tune into that next Tuesday, 2 p.m. Also, I'd like to point out that our partner for Cancer Immunotherapy Awareness Month, 1-800-Flowers.com, is running a promotion this June. You can buy a bouquet of flowers from their Fight with White collection, white representing the power of immunotherapy to conquer all cancers. 10% of the, of the net proceeds from the sale of those items will come back to the Cancer Research Institute so you can send someone a smile and help fund more cancer research. Also, these are our Facebook, Twitter, and our blog links. If you'd like to stay in touch with us, if you want to stay up to date with all the latest happenings in cancer immunotherapy and at the Cancer Research Institute, these are three of the ways that you can do that. I'd also like to thank our sponsor one last time, Dendrion Corporation, for making this webinar series possible. And thank you. If you'd like to learn more, please join the fight with.